Hey there, creatives. Happy 2023. I am excited to be sharing these new episodes with you all. Uh, today, you're going to be hearing a conversation that I had with licensed clinical social worker and somatically trained trauma therapist who specializes in integrating something called co-regulating touch, which is a therapeutic touch modality. And um, her name is Myra Holzman. And I just, I had the best conversation with her. Um, she's doing amazing work. And I loved speaking with her about not only how she kind of naturally fell into um, developing this niche over time, but also how developing the niche allowed her to uh, really become more empowered in in the way she ran her practice. And I just, I really hope you enjoy this conversation. I know I really did. The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm Raina Lombardi, and I am delighted to welcome my next guest to the show. Her name is Myra Holtzman, and she is a licensed clinical social worker, and she is a body-based, somatically trained trauma therapist specializing in helping adults heal from childhood trauma. She's committed to the vision of ending the consequences of trauma from the be being uh, from being past on to future generations and understands the importance of including the body as an ally in the healing process. Myra is passionate about the therapeutic touch modality called co-regulating touch that deeply supports healing the nervous system and healing relational trauma. Myra runs a group psychotherapy practice called Somatic Therapy Partners, whose focus is on healing the nervous system, nurturing resilience, and increasing a client's healthy connection with their body. She believes that the mind and body are one, and that when mind and body are integrated and regulated, capacity for service and spiritual growth expands. When she's not therapizing, Myra is out playing in the mountains with her amazing family. As a huge nature lover with a passion for adventure, the mountain the mountains are where she goes to wander, play, recharge, unplug, and wind down. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Raina, I'm so stoked to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Ah, I I love that the mountains are where you go to play. There's something I feel like that is super spiritual about being climbing, you know, even hike, hiking. I don't climb per se, like rock climb, but right. I love hiking. And there is something about getting to the summit of a really strenuous hike where you feel challenged, but you also feel connected. A thousand percent. Well, then if you get, even, even if you don't get to a peak, but you just to get to some uh, ground that's higher, right? You're rewarded with these epic views of just how vast the world is and our little small place in it is human. So it's one of my favorites. It's, it's, uh, I used to be an outward bound instructor. So I used to teach mountaineering in California oh, wow. and Colorado and South Africa. And it's really what helped me. It's, it's the foundation for who I am. If I hadn't done that, honestly, I don't know if I would be in as great a place in my life as I am currently. So that was really a formative part of my life. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I just got back about um, 
I guess now we're like a month and a half ago, I spent almost two weeks out in Colorado. Um, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. It was like the season is, was just starting to shift. And mm -hmm. so the first handful of days, it was chilly, but like once you got hiking, it was, it was beautiful. And yeah. then like the first kind of blizzard hit. And that was a little bit scary driving on the mountains, oh but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was beautiful. It's just gorgeous out there. Yeah. If you came out two months ago, then we were transitioning into fall where all of the aspens were changing leaves from green to all of the golds and the reds and the oranges. It's a really special time here. I, I'm located out of Denver. My practice is located out of Denver. So I know exactly what you were heading into. So sort of the tumultuous change in weather, but also the beauty of the mountains and the changing of the uh, aspens. Uh, it was gorgeous, really, nice. really spectacular and um, very like, very, uh, very calming, <laughs> very calming. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Super grounding to be in that much nature because nature is so still and so vast versus modern life that is you know, these small buildings like houses and cars moving and everything goes really by very quickly. It's a very different way of impacting your nervous system than when you're just in this yawning expanse of the mountains that's quiet and still. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's like, like a very beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, mm. it definitely. And I had my first up close and personal bear sighting, which... <laughs> was uh, it was like terrifying but amazing at the same time <laughs> um we had just reached like kind of um come out of a clearing and the hike was transitioning to a short road that led to like another access point yeah. and I saw something like maybe like 50 feet up in the distance and I was like gosh that seems hairy and <laughs> and this giant bear like comes up and uh, my friend and I, who I was with, we, we had our phones in our hand and everything, but we were so in the like moment of just screaming bear, bear, and like walking backwards that we That's didn't right. think to take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> Your first bear sighting can be really alarming and exciting, just as you described. I've had a couple of them and it's, it's both of those things. It was both of those things for me every time. Uh, it was awesome. Anyway, yeah. I could talk forever about the, those things. I That's how I really love to take care of myself too, is going out and spending time in nature. Yeah. Um, I'm in Florida, so live by the beach. Usually I can spend a fair amount of time on the beach. It's where we had this massive hurricane hit in October, which that's has right. been super destructive. So I haven't been out um, just cause there's, it, it's just not safe. Really. They're still yeah. like taking so much stuff out of the water and stuff. So I, I miss that, but I was grateful to get away after the storm and go out to the mountains and spend some time out there. It really did help re-regulate my nervous system because I was having percent. like a really big trauma response to the storm myself. No doubt. How could you not? I mean, it's a natural disaster that's happening. And then you've got to prepare and brace and do all the things to make sure that you can ensure your safety to the best of your ability. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. the safe, like my safety, what was going on with all the people in my practice and how they were impacted, um, yeah. like the therapist in my practice, but also the clients in, in the practice. And yeah, so it's a lot. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm glad things are moving to, um, more towards recovery in the, in the area. So it's feeling a little bit less stressful, but it's not, it's not quite back to normal just yet. Yeah. It'll take I'm glad to time. hear it's improving though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is improving. So tell me a little bit about, um, how you, became focused on somatics as a psychotherapist and what really pulled you into that modality as opposed to maybe some of the other trauma modalities like EMDR, for example? Yeah, thanks for that question. I really, I really appreciate this question. So early in my career, I had, I'd worked at a, a number of places. I'd worked for 
working with uh, persistently uh, and chronically mentally ill folks with a state agency. And then from there, I had launched into working with eating disorders. And I had worked in eating disorders, I can't remember now because my career feels, feels long, but I was maybe working in eating disorders for about five years at agencies. And I kept watching the recidivism rates be really high. I mean, sometimes yeah. within an agency, I would see four or five, six clients come back within a two to three year span time, like multiple times, not just one time. Yeah. And talk therapy just wasn't cutting it. It just wasn't, you know, some people it really worked and other people it didn't. And of course that is, that's the way it is with any modality. It's not going to work for everyone typically. Mm -hmm. And one of my colleagues had told me about Peter Levine's somatic experiencing training. Yeah. And I had moved, I had just moved out to California to be with my husband who was in the military and decided to take the first module. And when I arrived and going through the training, it just felt like all these light bulbs went off. Like, oh my God, this is the way, like, this is the way to take all of the things that happen in our head and then connect it into our body and then synthesize it and come up with something different. And so as the more training that I took with the somatic experiencing mm -hmm. approach, the more that I was hooked. And one of the things about taking the SE trainings is that it's all experiential. The way yeah. that I was trained back in the day is they gave you the handouts for what you were learning, the cognitive stuff at the end of the training versus like, here's your material. We're going to work through it slide by slide, et cetera, et cetera. So you had no, I mean, you would take notes and all, I would take notes and do all of those kinds of things. But being in the body and doing all of the practices, like here was the first practice we did. And that I was on the beach. We were in San Diego in Carlsbad when I took my first training. And I think it was the first or second day. And the instructor said, okay, I want you to find a partner. And for the next two hours, and you're going to take one hour each, I just want you to follow every impulse in your body. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> yeah. Like just follow anything you want to do. And your partner is going to follow you and do everything you do. Kind of like having like a little shadow. So the training where we were doing the training was this hotel literally right across the car, right across the street from the Carlsbad beach. And I was like, hell yes, let's go do this. So I was doing cartwheels on the beach. I was running through the water with my pant legs rolled up. And then when I get tired, I just lay down and make sand angels. And I had this, I had my, uh, partner, another participant, do everything with me. And one of the instructions was like, you could talk, but it wasn't really about talking. It was just about observing and being with this person. And I remember thinking how fun it was to have this partner, this person that I didn't even know that wasn't even really talking to me, doing these things because we were both in joy. We were delighted. Mm. We and And that's one of the things that I tend to be really good at. I'm really good at being in joy and being delighted by things. And that's when I got hooked. I was like, well, any training that's going to tell me I can go follow any impulse I want for an hour, I'm in. And that was it. That was back in 2007 when I did that first training. So that's how it began. And then I just kept following the breadcrumbs that kept leading me to what I currently do now. And it's been a very rich and fruitful path in many different ways. And you know, one thing I'll say about it is it has really helped me to heal some of my own stuff. And that's mm -hmm. important. And I honestly, I feel yeah. like the people who people like you and I, and those, those folks that are listening, we're in this because we've got our stuff that we want to work on. And it really helps to find the way that suits you best that can allow you to really transform tragedy into triumph, you know, wounding yeah. into winning, however you want to say it. So that somatics was the way for me and continues to be the way. Uh, that sounds incredible um, and fun, right? Yes. Fun, which yeah. I feel like in so many ways, therapy can feel not fun. Like it doesn't feel easy. It feels hard, especially yeah. when we're, you know, excavating all of this like, yucky archaeology that we have stored and have worked really hard to be like yeah that happened a long time ago I don't want to deal <laughs> with that right. right now <laughs> you know so to be able to approach those kinds of things from a space of levity I think makes it so much more accessible 
and maybe even helps to break down some of the stigma about, ew, like, I don't want to go talk about my history. Like, you know, yeah, I love the way that you said that. I mean, you know, psychology is built upon our Western medical foundation of focusing on pathology versus prevention, right? So, so many, I mean, I've been a therapist for over 20 years at this point. I was trained to focus on pathology and focus on symptomology and to know how to diagnose, right? And I don't know how it is in grad school these days. I'm sure it's very similar. And one of the things that the somatic approach from the get-go teaches you is like, okay, when you feel the hard stuff in the constriction, right? And you learn how to, as one of the most basic skills, turn your attention away from it and notice, let's say the constriction is in your chest because you're thinking about something that happened last week with your partner who can be, you know, who can say mean things to you. Mm -hmm. And then you actively teach a client to move their attention to some other place in their body that feels better. Even if it's just a little less anxious or a little less tight, it's like they're already that approach. And then more of what I've synthesized as part of my training is helping clients arrive at goodness through feeling it in their body. Because mm-hmm. pleasure isn't pleasure isn't a thing that we think about in our head, right? If I say, how was your you know, hike in, in Colorado, you're going to be like, that was so fun, right? <laughs> Even when you were talking about it, you were smiling, you were moving, your eyes were moving gently around the space. There was a softness in your face and your throat and your upper chest. Mm-hmm. That's what we can't feel when there's been trauma because we got really disconnected from our body. Yeah. So I love how you said it. We it's it we do need the levity and we also need therapists that can say, "Hey, here's what you can look forward to when you start healing. Here's what's coming for you." Which is something yeah. I say a lot to my clients. I'm saying to them because of course their attention is focused fully on the pain of things, the hardship of things, the challenge, the things that they can't do, the things that they're scared to do. And I'm saying I'm saying to them things like, "Look forward to the day when you know, your partner says something like that to you that doesn't feel good. And you stand right up and you say, yeah, that's not going to work for me. You need to shift that tone. Can you try again and not have to wait two weeks later as an example? Like, of course it's tailored to the client, but planting, I call that planting seeds, planting seeds with our clients that there's goodness waiting for you. If you can ride the wave of discomfort and pain, whether it's a yeah. memory of the body experience, right? That I think sometimes I think people call that post-traumatic growth. Right? Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. here's, here's what you get to experience when you do the hard work that feels like you just want to keep ignoring it for the rest of your life. Uh, yes. Yes. I love I've... the face you just made. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And of course, listeners aren't going to be able to see that, but I'm like really processing and taking that in. And it is powerful to be able to get to that place as an individual. Yes, And it's powerful to help support other people in their arrival of that place too. That's right. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So what other, besides somatic experiencing, what other techniques and tools have you integrated into your somatic approach? Because it seems like there's more than just that. Yeah. So, you know, somatics was a a door that I got to walk through and then expand within the realm of somatics. So somatic experiencing is one approach within a wider field of somatics. I mean, frankly, somatics includes things like acupuncture or taking a yoga class and learning how to track your body or even physical exercise. Right. Mm -hmm. So where I was led to was learning the approach or the intervention of co-regulating touch. And I'd love to tell that story if that's all right with you. I would love to hear that story. I want to learn more about what co-regulating touch is, how it can be beneficial and like how touch is important in relationship and um and connection yeah. and how it's this missing piece in the room <laughs> often agreed yeah so i had been advancing in it, somatic experiencing training is a 3 year training so you do beginning and then intermediate and then advanced and when i was doing the advanced training part of that training is that you start touching clients and there's a specific way of doing it 
And I had been working with an assistant who I adored. She had been at almost all of my trainings, supporting the training. And, you know, they were the assistants that observed us practicing. And she kept telling me about this woman named Kathy Kane. And Kathy Kane uh, wrote a book with my other teacher named Stephen Terrell called Nurturing Resilience. And th those two together taught this course. And I was like, great, I'm going to check that out. Because again, I was so buoyed up and invested and lit up by the everything that I was learning through somatic experiencing. So I did this sort of tangential path off of it because not everybody does this. And I attended the training and the first training is called Somatic Resilience and Regulation. That's the name of the training that Kathy and Stephen run. And the first hour they start talking about what this is for and who this is for and that we're gonna be learning how to apply therapeutic touch to help heal nervous systems. And this crazy thing happened that as they were talking, I suddenly understood that they were talking to me about me. And what I mean by that is that this approach in particular is really useful for early trauma. So early trauma, one, the main definition of early trauma is when things go really wrong in those first three years of life, when the nervous system and the brain are developing, um, a sense of safety gets deeply embedded in the nervous system as a way, or a lack of safety in the case of trauma. And I didn't know that. I mean, I, I have always known, and I've talked about this, it's on, I've, I've written things about my early trauma. I, I grew up with parents who were really not the great, not the greatest parents for me. And mm -hmm. I often um, either got hurt physically and, or was, you know, emotionally neglected and or abused. So I'm sitting in this training and this thing lands in my body. And I'm like, it's like this voice and it's this weight. It's this heaviness, like, oh, Myra, this is you. They're talking about you. And I mean, I can even feel a little bit tearful thinking about it because I didn't mm -hmm. realize it, right? Yeah. So we go through the training and I've, I've taken that training because I love it so much, literally like three or four times, just because the information changes over time because mm -hmm. we get more information from neuroscience and all of these things. And how I got into it is because of that. And, you know, I've been a therapist for, 20 years or more, probably 20, yeah, over 20 years, slightly over 20 years. And it was when I took that training that I suddenly landed in my purpose as a human, as a clinician. And it was like a thunk. It was like, ah, like a thunk and like lights went off, mm -hmm. you know, it was like lightning and gold light and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, and then this like really deep settling, restful easiness in the middle of my chest on top of the fact that as part of the training, you receive this form of therapeutic touch consistently. And after that first after that first class, and I think there's it's a three module class, I remember noting huge leaps in my growth process, like quantum leaps of shifting from one being a relative lack of safety and, and the way that my nervous system is wired is I go into fight. So I have this belief and I've seen it with my clients that everybody chooses generally tends towards one fight, flight, freeze. And then fawn is another mm -hmm. one that we've, you know, that has started to come up. So everyone is like, this is what I do when I'm under threat. I don't run away. I definitely don't shut down and freeze up. I, I go into fight. I'm like, you want to go? Well, let's go. And I lean in <laughs> and I can do that. And as you can imagine, if you're wired towards fight relationally, that's not so great. No. People don't like to be around people that are angry or hostile or overly critical. And one, one five-day training, and all of a sudden, I had this wider berth of ease where things that would normally impact me and kind of set me off, right, would just be like, yeah, that's kind of annoying, but God, that's so much energy to get angry. Why don't I just do this instead? And it, I mean, I was even inside of myself watching this shift happen going, what the heck is going on right now? This is not your normal pattern. And so it, it basically deepened what I had already learned in my somatic experiencing training in terms of somatic awareness. Sometimes it's called interoceptive awareness, which is the oh, yeah. ability to feel what's happening on the inside of your body and then have words for it. Mm -hmm. And these teachers, I mean, they became energetically the parents that and I even told them this mm. just not just that not that long ago I was like you guys helped me heal some huge parenting wounds that I had just by just by the way that you are by being instructors mm. so I could go off forever about this training and how it changed my life and you know when I work with clients and when clients call I can speak about it with such clarity and confidence because I've lived it not only have yeah. I probably lived some aspect of the experience that they're coming to me for, because 
my group, Somatic Therapy Partners, we lead with focusing on helping clients with anxiety as well as early trauma. Like I'm, I consider myself an early trauma specialist. So I can just speak from it from a lived experience, a deeply embodied experience. And then I watch my clients literally miraculously change. And the clients that come to me are people that have tried everyone. They've gone to see the shamans, the therapists for, you know, five to 25 years, the nutritionist, the, you name it. And then they come and they start getting regular touch work and the world suddenly feels different. And what's different is they have a sense of safety that's lived in their body versus this concept of safety where they have to maybe over control things, right? Like I'll only mm -hmm. feel safe if you talk quietly to me and you talk at a certain cadence and we have to be sitting down. I mean, I'm being dramatic for the example, but that's often how safety or that need for safety shows up is a deep need to control things. Yeah. And I was, I was suddenly fluid about things that would normally have just sent me straight to the roof. And I keep watching myself deepen in that experience and just be able to pivot. And it's remarkable. It's remarkable. It sounds, it sounds incredibly powerful. It is. It's, it's one of the best, mo it is the best modality that I have ever been trained in. And I've taken a lot of trainings from expressive arts to being a DBT clinician to mindfulness training. Like I've taken a lot of different things as, as we as psychotherapists mm -hmm. tend to do. And this is the one that landed me in my purpose and healed my, you know, continues to heal my nervous system so that I can be more of who I really am, which is joyful and energetic and connected and generous. Mm. And that feels really good in the body. Yeah, those are amazing feelings to feel into. <laughs> <laughs> like that's what we're all looking for, right? We're I know, all looking right? for that. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about like just kind of the basic of what does that actually look like, co-regulating touch? Yeah. So what happens when clients come in and they start receiving this form of therapeutic touch is they lay down with their, on a, usually, they usually lay down. Some clients would prefer to sit, um, but they lay down on my massage table fully clothed. So they're fully clothed the entire time. And the touch that we apply is, is in specific places. It can change over time, but in the initial work where the focus of the work is about bringing regulation, physiological regulation into the body healing the nervous system from its old pattern of being dysregulated to more regulated. They will lay down and I will slide my hand under their back and touch their kidney. And I'm making air quotes because obviously I'm not touching their kidney. That would require surgery and me coming in, right? That's not really yes. what's happening, but they lay down. I slide my hand under the middle of their back towards the bottom of their rib cage, left or right. And I'll hold their kidney. And then I'll move up to the, I'll do both kidneys. So first, the first kidney, then the second kidney. And I'm not moving my hand. I'm not trying to manipulate tissue. I'm not trying to do anything in terms of getting the body to do what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. What I'm really doing is helping to remind the nervous system of how it knows how to operate and be regulated, right? A, regu mm -hmm. a well-regulated nervous system can come up into activation. It can be good activation, like me being happy to see my kid and, you know, spreading yeah. my arms wide open. It could be um, stressful stuff where I'm like, you know, pulling my hair out and just being like, oh my God, how am I going to get to this? But whatever it is, there's activation and then the body is meant to settle. And for folks who have had early experiences of safety and belonging that have been attuned enough that sort of rise and fall of the nervous system is embedded early, right? Yeah. When there's been early trauma, that pattern is not there. So there's a distinction between early trauma and shock trauma. Early trauma is where your nervous system hasn't embedded the rhythm of safety, so to speak, and the mm -hmm. experience of safety in the body. And then shock trauma is, yeah, it's that, that, regulated rhythm is present, but it got knocked way out of balance because of this really hard adverse thing that happened. Right. So I'm really sitting there quietly with my client and holding their right kidney and then their left kidney and then their brainstem and then their ankles. That would be sort of the full initial route for the regulation protocol, so to speak. And a lot of what I'm doing is simply being with, but in a very specific attuned, loving, compassionate way. And I know that mm -hmm. all psychotherapists show up with their clinicians, attuned, compassionate, loving, and all of those kinds of things. And this is a little bit different because 
with this approach, while I'm wanting to support the nervous system and healing, I'm also doing this balancing act where I'm like, basically accepting whatever arises in the session without an agenda. I'm not yeah. here to say, oh, you did this maladaptive behavior. So let's focus on that. Even though, of course, I do that, especially when I'm talking to clients. So I can be sitting with a client and this just happened yesterday. I was I was touching a, a new area on this client's body. So the other regulation place that we can touch is the stomach. Kind of makes mm -hmm. sense, right? So if your stomach and your yeah. brain talk to each other, that's the second, we talk about that as being second the second brain. brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So cognitively, this client was like, yeah, no problem. I'd love for you to touch my stomach. And I'm like, great. So I get to her stomach and all of a sudden, and it's subtle, her face gets really like her lips purse, her jaw clenches a little, her eyes are, it looks like she's focusing with her eyes closed. And I'm just waiting and I'm pausing and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having this gentle, easy conversation with the body. And if I was to give it words, it might sound something like no problem. Yeah, you can be resistant. You don't have to do anything different right now. So I just waited and waited and it was maybe like a minute or two. And then I could feel things starting to shift within her body. There was a little bit more movement, a little bit more warmth. And then I kept looking at her face because it was one of the signals that was telling me that she, she said it was okay. And I'm pointing to my mind, right. but her body was like, I don't know you. Why are you touching me there? What's going on? Right? right. Because that's often the disconnect that happens in trauma. And eventually she could start feeling the waves in her own stomach. There was more warmth. We were like, you know, there were waves happening within the body itself. And then by the end of that contact, her face was soft as mm -hmm. if she was like resting peacefully without any ado. So I'm sort of giving you, you know, what happens where, because what I was talking about was, yes, I have an agenda to help you help the body remember how to regulate. But I'm also like, yeah, you don't, you do that in your own time. I don't have right. to, this, has, this doesn't have to happen right now, right? There's no hurry because the body has to move at its own pace for healing. That's for sure. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. can't, we can't rush through resistance. Resistance has a function and a purpose and we have to just sit alongside it. Um, That's although right. it brings up a lot of discomfort. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it really does. And this client even said like, yeah, I could feel my body totally resisting you, even though, cause, and she said she was confused about it. Like, even though I said it was going to be okay, my body wasn't ready for it. And I was like, right. Yeah. You know, and that's really important to be able to listen to that resistance and really accept it. Like, even if I'm talking with clients and I say, Hey, what about if you tried this? Like, just as an example, and I can see them kind of resisting or they're kind of like screwing up their face. Like that's not a good idea. And I'll just say, no problem. Like just planting a seed. And when you're ready, you'll pick it up. And if you're not ready, then what I trust is your own body's wisdom is going to find its way to the answer that you need to get to, which is really empowering for people, right? Yes. I don't want to be that clinician. Like I'm an expert in what I do, but my clients are an expert in themselves and their patterns and the way that they think about things and how they orient. And it's early in my career, I would just think of myself as the expert, like, here, let me help you figure out how to do this eating disorder because you're doing it wrong. That's a problem. I mean, I'll just admit it straight up. That's a problem to orient that way to your clients, right? Because it makes them wrong. And clients who and most of us ex have experienced some form of trauma, the system is going to pick that up. And then the resistance is going to grow greater and greater because mm -hmm. there hasn't been that initial attunement and acceptance that needs to happen first. Right. Yeah. There, there doesn't even need to be words said. There is, there is, and I, I think for many folks that um, particularly if they've had early childhood trauma, they are receptive to um, sensing hostility without, without their having to be in the same room, right? They're, they're able to pick that stuff up. I think we're all able to do that, yes. but I think that because of the, because of the traumatic um, experience that one has had, or maybe it happened in, you know, for children that have lived in abusive households, it's a repetitive pattern. They need to be able to listen to that inner wisdom because that's going to help them 
stay safe from the adult that is unsafe <laughs> in the household, right? Without having yes. to be in the same room, like, oh, like I'm sensing that I'm just going to hide in the closet or <laughs> like, what if I'm going to see if I can go to my friend's house, whatever it is to right. pr protect themselves. So, um, yeah, I think that that's huge to have that awareness and to be able to share that so that other people um, maybe open themselves up to this idea that yeah. yes, we have a lot of education. We have a lot of training. We work really hard to acquire all the knowledge and skills. We, we practice those skills for an extensive period of time. And yet we we are not, and we never will be the expert in another person's lived experience. Exactly right. I mean, I resonate with everything that you've just said. It makes, it makes me really like relax in my stomach. And there's this like really nice, warm, buzzing feeling in my chest. There's so much resonance with what you just said, mm -hmm. especially the things that you were talking about in terms of when there's been early trauma and you've grown up, let's say in an unsafe home, those children. And I consider myself that child that grew up that's like knows how to be super attuned because you better believe I needed to keep myself safe. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what I was mentioning earlier about transforming trauma into triumph. Like one of my superpowers is attunement. Yeah. And I, right. And I, and it's made me a very sensitive person literally for almost all, for my whole life. And it was a bad thing growing up. My parents would even say things like, you're so sensitive. Like, why do you have to be so sensitive? And it's like, well, <laughs> you guys have a hand and you know, in a mean way, but like you guys have a hand and why I have to be so sensitive because all of my energy is going towards keeping myself safe. It is the right. nature of the brain. And so one way or another, I'm going to figure out how to do that. And if it means that I've got to like, know that one look that my dad gives, my dad used to give when I was in trouble and I would just have to go outside and ride my bike for an hour until he cooled down. You better believe I was going to go do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And it sounds like this particular approach just taps right into the response system in a way that um, I, I don't want to say like, mm, I'm struggling for the correct, like the right word. I don't want to say disarms the defense system, because it's not, because you're still getting that response. Yeah. But we're circumventing the ability to go into like the intellectualizing and the verbal hoops to go around like, oh yeah, that's not really an issue. Or I don't really notice that, you know, you're yeah. kind of hitting right in, you're getting that immediate feedback from the client, but you're not, you're doing it in a gentle way. That's right. I think circumventing is a great word to describe this. And by this, it's the way that I talk about it is you have a known and unknown, meaning your conscious ways that you protect yourself. And then a, so many subconscious and unconscious ways. And I, my job is to help your nervous system get out of its survival physiology, mm. right? Like survival yeah. physiology, generally speaking, is one of either constriction because you have to brace all the time if you're preparing for the worst mm -hmm. or it's collapse. Meaning like I just use up all my life force energy trying to protect myself and now I can't do anything. I've got no motivation for life. My life force energy feels greatly diminished right? And that's that's what happens over the long haul of clients who don't heal their early trauma. So t my teacher, Kathy Kane, her population that she worked with was the chronically ill. I mean, these were people who had diagnosed and undiagnosed chronic illnesses. And they these were the kind of folks that if they got up and took a shower and maybe went to the grocery store, it was a massive win. So she was working with folks who were whose nervous systems were hugely compromised, right? Yeah. From years and years of living in this survival physiology that as Bessel van der Kolk, I think it was him that talks about, you know, the high cost of doing business. It was either van der Kolk mm -hmm. or Porges, the high cost of doing business of living in survival physiology. Absolutely. And so what 
this form of, you know, what this form of therapeutic does, therapeutic touch does is it helps the nervous system relax, literally. Like mm -hmm. that is literally one of the main things I see on the table and sometimes in dramatic ways. I remember I had a one, cl one client the first time that she came and we had had this session and she was a body worker and a very, very skilled body worker. She worked in, you know, she worked with athletes and <clears throat> excuse me. She got up from her first session and all, all every, everything pointed to the fact that her system really greatly relaxed. She became heavier to the table. Her face got soft. Her eyes underneath her eyelids started moving slowly, indicating that she was going into kind of a deep rest day. And she sat up and she was a little bit, you know, disoriented as sometimes can happen. And then all of a sudden she started crying. And I said, what's happening right now? And she said, I don't understand what's happening. I said, what can you, is there anything you want to share with me about what's going on? And she said, I don't know what this feels, what's happening in my body. And I said, you know, just try this on. I wonder if this maybe is the first time you've ever been able to relax so deeply and you don't recognize the state of like utter release and relaxation and heaviness. And then she started bawling. And she was like, is that what this is? Like, I'm tearful thinking about it now. Wow. And I said, I, I said, I think that's what this is. And it's okay that it's scary because it's new. Right. Right. I mean, that to me was mind blowing utterly and heart, heart opening it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is what your body's been waiting for. And this is probably what you've needed, but didn't know how to give yourself or get from those around you. Mm hmm you get that, right? Yeah, like I saw absolutely. your face. Yeah. And I've had a few experiences where clients get scared because they're like, why do I feel so good? And it sounds paradoxical that someone might be like scared of feeling good. And if the pattern has always been to be scared and afraid and braced, if you're suddenly feeling good and light and I don't know, you know, wanting yeah. to connect, that can be really alarming. So I just want to really validate that feeling good isn't always the end all be all with working with our clients. We sometimes have to like bring from the somatic approach, bring our clients into goodness in these very small manageable ways so yeah. that their system and their mind doesn't go, nope, no, 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 this is totally dangerous. This is super bad. And then snap back into its old survival physiology. Uh, I, I love the way that you just described that process. It's really profound because people come in and that's what they want. They want to feel good. And yet they've lived in a body and an environment where it wasn't safe to allow themselves to be that open, to be that vulnerable. And so it, it does it instead of being like, this is awesome. It's like so unfamiliar. That's right that the brain can't process like this is it's unfamiliar if it's unfamiliar it must be dangerous i have to go back into protecting myself and you're right it like brings them right back to where they started it's too much if it's too much too fast and that's it it's like the same thing we talk about changing cognitions you know, if you try to reframe, if you try to get somebody to reframe something from the position of they're in a state of total apathy to like a state of exaltation, well, you can't get there from there. You have to go to the next, the next least distressing feeling, which is probably going to be a crappy one, right? <laughs> it's not, yes, Raina. We're not going right. to go from depressed to happy. <sighs> yeah. But, but it's the same, like, it's the same thing with what you're saying with that felt sense within the body. We can't go from one extreme all the way to the other extreme. That's right. It's too, too much, too quick. It's too much, too quick. And, you know, one of the, one of the leading concepts in the somatic experiencing approach is a concept called titration, right? Which is yes. just doing little bits at a time. And I think that with therapy and with coaching and all the self-help, and I read a lot of self-help, I watch a lot of, you know, I, I, that's what my newsfeed is about. <laughs> I see these things that it's like, you know, manifest your destiny in a three-day course. And I'm like, y'all are nuts. And I say that with love, but it's, 
the body has to, the body is the slowest mechanism in, in the system, right? The, our energetic field is really fast. Our thoughts can shift really fast. I can totally believe that I'm worthy and deserving of abundance and good friends and joy and all those things. Mm -hmm. And if my body has been wired to be braced and not safe, there's no, it's going to be really, really challenging for me to receive that fully without going into some kind of fear response, which usually means that there, everyone's inner saboteur is going to be like, oh, okay, you think things are going well? Let me do this thing. I'm dropped this little bomb in your life. You know, they're going to do something. They're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to, I don't know, start using again, or they're going to mm -hmm. watch Netflix all day long while they smoke pot, like some way. And that's when I know that I've done too much. If like things are progressing and progressing. And so I actually tell my clients, I'm like, you're going to progress and progress and progress. And then there's going to be a time where you go backwards. And I just want you to know that's part of the recovery process. That's part of healing is that you're going to muck it up. You're going to, your inner saboteur is going to be like, I can't handle all this goodness. So let's do something to bring me back exactly where I know how to live in my comfort zone, which is feeling sad for myself or being self-negating or whatever it might be. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think that's super important because it helps to destigmatize it too of like, if I'm, ex if I, if I'm aware that that's part of the process, then I don't have to carry so much shame when I let myself down and, and get to that place. Yeah. Uh, but I think, yeah. you know, one of the things, um, we talked about possibly talking about was related to scarcity, which, you know, if we're thinking about that as therapists, a lot of us are working really hard to try and create beautiful lives for ourselves while also impacting the lives of others and in, in, in empowering and nurturing ways. Yeah. This episode of the creative psychotherapist is brought to you by Florida art therapy services. Florida art therapy services is a proud provider of continuing education sponsored through the Florida Board of Clinical Social Work, Marriage and Family Therapy and Mental Health Counseling, and offers a wide variety of continuing education trainings on the topics of supervision, art therapy, and other requirements for Florida licensure. We are excited to be welcoming special guest uh, trainers, art therapists, Carol Cox and Amy Bucciarelli, who will be teaching a Mastering the Meaning of Mandalas training. It's a three-day intensive training, which will allow participants to earn 20 hours worth of CEUs. And that's going to be taking place April 28th through 30th, 2023 at our Fort Myers office. Over the course of the three days, people will be exploring mandala making as a way to find identity and meaning through the lens of the life cycle. It's taught in a unique format, which incorporates lectures, meditation, music, and lots of artistic creation of mandalas as well. I took this training in 2019, and I was blown away by the content and it's altered my work uh, since having taken the training and I'm excited to take it again. And I really encourage you all to check it out. If you have any interest in deepening your understanding of the mandala and um, helping to use it as a, uh, a source of greater understanding with your clients, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Amy and Carol do a phenomenal job. And you can learn more about that training and all the other trainings that we provide at Florida Art Therapy Services on our website, www.floridaarttherapyservices.com. Just click on the continuing education menu and you'll get a drop down and you can click on Mastering the Meaning of Mandalas or one of the other trainings as well. But I think like you were saying, we all come from our own lived experience. We all bring some inner wounding with us into this work. 
mm-hmm. that um, that we're working through too. And so how does that relate to being a therapist with a practice? Like how do those scarcity patterns impact our ability to um, create practices that truly do help us thrive? Yeah. So a a few things. So one thing I want to say about how, and not that you have to have early trauma and then that scarcity and early trauma, to me, they always go together, but you don't have to have early trauma to struggle with scarcity because we grow up in scarcity culture, right? That there's just Mm -hmm. not enough. You know, I could tell you some stories about, I'll give you one story about my mom. My mom was complaining. I was eight years old. I was sitting in the backseat and my mom was complaining about how much she disliked her job. And I looked at her at my eight-year-old self said, well, why don't you just quit your job and get a better one? And she looked at me and she's like, oh, you'll see when you get older, you'll hate your job too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like that was just, that was just the recipe. Like, that's just what you did. Like you take a job and you dislike it. And then you just have to suffer through it until you've earned enough retirement or you've done whatever you need to do in order to not work again. Right. So that's just <sighs> culture that has nothing to do with you know, early trauma. And what I have noticed, because I've attended a lot of trainings with a lot of trauma therapists, both for somatic experiencing as well as touch, is that by and large, I feel like there's a lot of scarcity thinking. And if you think about it, if you grow up in those early years where all of your life force energy has to go into protecting yourself from harm, Mm -hmm. from being left, from bullying, whatever it might be, then there isn't this wide field of like, oh, life is good. Like I'm getting all my needs met. And, you know, I've I've got a lot of great friends and there's enough money and there's enough food. Like, because again, your life force energy is going into deep protection. So for a lot of the clinicians that I work with and I love them, I hear a lot of scarcity talking. And so if we're talking about how to support thriving therapists, I mean, that's that's a big that's a big thing to tackle, right? So here's the way that I talk about it. And one thing I'll say is that I'm I'm currently working on a coaching program to do just this. Um, right now, there's two names. The first one is Go Pro Therapist, Do Good, Live Large. So going pro. And then the other one that I like better is, and it's gonna, I think it's probably gonna be called More Thriving Therapist, because that feels like a mission of mine, because I'm in a lot of Facebook groups with therapists, as I'm sure that you are. And I read through some of these posts and I'm like, and I, and I mean this with all the love in the world. It's like, wow, there's a lot of self-limiting beliefs here. There's a lot. Yes. Your eyes are so big right now. Uh, Yes. I like, I, I stumbled across something yesterday and I was like, oh, this is really generous. This person's giving a bunch of resources away. But then when I went on there, there was like disclaimers about the people that they don't support and they'll never support. Um, And I was like, oh, uh, well, I should leave now because I'm not welcome here. (laughs) Um, But it but it was based in this this idea that, well, like if you don't take insurance, then you're, you know, shame on you. Right. Like you you can't be doing good in the world and you're part of an oppressive system if you're not taking insurance, which I don't believe I've taken insurance and now I don't take insurance. And I feel like I have so much more freedom and I feel better without taking insurance because I don't feel like I am having to um, be like fighting constantly to get paid where with the insurance company, there's so so much, but, but between that and then between other people saying, you know, how dare you for charging, you know, whatever the fee might be. And I just so much stuff in the field. And it's sad because I think everybody has the right to follow their own dream, to create their own destiny aligned with what they need to thrive in this world. And that's going to be different for every single human being and every single individual circumstance for somebody that maybe, you know, they have a partner that um, brings in 
a substantial income to such a degree that the therapist doesn't actually need to contribute any income to pay bills, they might be able to be like, yeah, I can see people at this super low fee and I can do, you know, this level of work and feel really good about what I'm doing. But for other people, if they're, you know, a single parent with three kids and, you know, maybe they had a health condition and student loans and, you know, just the cost of living these days. Yes. Yes. And that's going to be totally different. And why are we shaming that person for needing to charge whatever the fee is that they need to charge after they've been through all this education and training and credentialing and blah, 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 blah. I think therapists are probably some of the most educated people that walk around the planet. <laughs> Agreed. I mean, I'm, you know, your listeners can't see me, but I've been basically pointing at you and nodding my head. Yes. And like tapping my heart because you're, you're basically talking about everything that I want to address in this course. And there's, you know, there's one of the things is that, and I've had this experience before where clinicians will find out how much I charge and be like, how, not, how can you do that? I want to do that. But like, how can you live with yourself? Right. And I'm like, what? I, and like, I was sitting in a car full of clinicians after a training and this wasn't where they said, where someone said that to me, but they were talking about how they all take insurance and insurance is such a racket and they get paid so little. Right. And I'm just listening quietly. And they're like, yeah, but we've got to take insurance because, you know, people really need this. And I'm like, true. So some people really need to use their insurance. And even just yesterday, I was on a Facebook post and this um, this therapist was talking about how Alma was such a great platform because it was the highest paying platform compared to insurance in his 25 years of experience as a psychotherapist. And one of the things he said was, our people can't handle a $180 session out of pocket because of the financial crisis that we're in. And I was very, very kind. And I just said, I hear you. I, here's the, I'm great. I'm glad that Alma really works for you. And I beg to differ that people cannot afford to pay out of pocket $180 or more. He wrote back saying that, and basically the subtle message was, if we're going to really heal the world, then we've got to work with people who take insurance because that's the only way. And my clients aren't rich. And one of my responses that I wanted to say was, and neither are mine. Like I charge probably the highest fee that I have heard in the Denver area. And I don't say that to, to brag or anything. And what my clients get from their sessions is, is tremendous. It's life changing right. for them. And because my clients are not rich, not all of them, I have some wealthy clients, but a lot of them are like, no, this is my priority. I am committed to finding the funds, even if, even if it means I eat out a little less for a year, or I don't get that extra bauble that I wanted to get at Target, right? Because mm -hmm. this is important to me. Right. And I didn't respond back to his response. I just said, you know, cheers to you for contributing the way that you want to contribute by taking insurance. But my thing was, I charge premium fees. I see only my ideal clients. I have a practice that allows me to thrive and live the way that I want to, where I'm not having to work and work and work in order to get the life that I want, because that's the hamster wheel. Right. And I just don't think therapists in general, psychotherapists are trained in school, one, how to run a business and two, how to really honor themselves and, and all of the dedication that we put into our work. I mean, yeah. how many trainings have you taken? How many thousands of dollars did you spend on your education? How many hours have you had to put in for your internship, for your, mm -hmm. you know, practicums for with clients to hone your ability? Right. So, you know, more thriving therapists, <laughs> that sounds to me like a great mission. And I want other, and I don't mean by just having more money. I mean, you know, one of my, my tagline is do good, live large. 
live large is the least about getting more material gain. It's about having more time with your family, yes. more, right? More space to be creative and find other ways to serve and maybe serve a, on a greater level than one-to-one therapy or, you know, seeing a group, like seeing a group weekly or something like that. Mm-hmm. And when we're stuck in scarcity, we're stuck in this little tunnel where it's like, oh, well, I guess this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life is, you know, charge 150 a session and see clients one-to-one. It's like, great. If that totally works for someone, right? Fantastic. And if there's other ways that you want to live large, there are ways to do that. So, you know, back to what we were talking about in terms of scarcity mindset and early trauma, to me, they go hand in hand and I could just be projecting. I'll just take responsibility for the fact that because I had early trauma, I've had to overcome a lot of scarcity mindset, you know, cemented neural pathways Mm -hmm. and somatic patterns that keep me really wanting to play small. And I just don't believe that that's, you know, I've done enough work that I don't, I don't need to play that game anymore. I don't need to believe those old cult, that old cultural conditioning that has me be really small in my life. That's not, and it's also not who I am. So. No, I, I love that. I, it, yeah, that no need to play small, be large. Be large, yeah. play large, get yeah. your voice out there, get your message out there because the message is important and yeah. valuable. And the only way that we really can make a dramatic impact and shift in the world that we're living in is when we are willing to put ourselves out there and say, hey, I have something really important to say, and you really, it would be beneficial for you to listen, (laughs) but if we're playing small, we're not going to, we're not going to be having this conversation and publishing this conversation online for whoever around the world to listen to. We're not going to be doing that. You know, we're going to be hiding in our office, seeing our clients one-to-one. And like you said, continuing on that hamster wheel. Yeah. I, you know, I I love, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I love your mission. Thank you. I mean, you know, especially with COVID therapists and and a lot of healing providers in general, doctors, nurses, et cetera, we've all experienced burnout. I mean, it's, it's, it's the pandemic after the pandemic is burnout and to be a thriving therapist means that you can actively prevent and never have to go into burnout again. And I know because I've been practicing it. I mean, I have been practicing like, oh, here's, here are the early signs, Myra, that you're starting to go into burnout. You're craving sugar. You think you have to work longer hours. You want to stay in bed longer in the morning versus get up and go work out or whatever it might be, because I have been able to identify here's, here's how it goes, Myra. So attend to it as quickly as you can get there. Right. And when you become a thriving therapist and you can do good and live large at the same time, that's everything. That's everything. And then you could be of great of greater service when your body is not stuck in survival physiology. Absolutely. Right? Yes. That's it. Yeah. Because yeah, you're not making you're not making survival based decisions. That's right. That's right? right. You're not making decisions from a place of fear. Right. And 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 obvious it seems obvious to me, but maybe that's my own patterning of like Mm. recognizing that that was what I was doing was like falling into that same pattern of like feeling like afraid that I had to take insurance in order to, in order to, to meet those needs of, of clients. And, and I loved the clients that I worked with when I was taking insurance and, and it was hard to terminate and say goodbye, but it was the best decision that I made for me because it allowed me to not only, you know, increase the fee, but decrease the number of clients that I was seeing per week, which mm-hmm. gave me so much more of my energy back yeah. to be able to do the things that you're talking about, like get up early and go to the gym and meditate and journal and do whatever it is that I need to do to take care of me. That's right. Um, which was very difficult to do when I was it is. It's taking scary. insurance and seeing so many people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th- when I'm thriving, then my clients thrive. 
So I just want to, I want to tell a little story about that leap. And I love that you were talking about the leap from going from insurance to private practice and then setting your fees and all of that. So in the last year, I have raised my rates twice. And the first time I raised my rates, I sent the email out to not all of my clients because I knew some of them needed to wait a little bit longer. They were under financial stress and I just made the decision for them. So I sent that, I sent that email out to 13 clients. Five or six of them came back to me in that week and their responses were things like, way to go, Myra. I'm so proud of you. You totally deserve that. That was one woman. I can picture her and what she said to me. Um, another client was just like, you are so worth it. This work that I've done with you in the last year has been the most transformative work I've ever done. Of course, I'm going to pay you your raised rates. Not even a question. That was the second one. So then recently, and this is to this point that I was talking about earlier, where I, you know, that person on that um, post was saying my clients aren't rich. This is a client who in the second wave of me raising my rates, I sent her the email and she has always talked in her sessions about how tight money is in her family, always. And I had to overcome my own guilt and maybe some shame or self-judgment about that. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, you know, we can talk about it if she asked for, you know, a sliding scale, we can talk about it. So she comes in and she goes, by the way, I got your email and I'm a little braced now. I'm like, okay, because I know what email she's talking about. And she's just like, I want to thank you. <laughs> I was like, what? Really? <laughs> yeah, because she works in the school system. She's a tutor and she works with, you know, kids tutoring. And she said, I want to thank you because you're showing me by example, you're leading by example that I can ask for a a wage, a rate that's going to allow me to support my family, have freedom and feel good about what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. I put my hand in my heart and I was like, really? Because I thought for sure uh, she was going to be upset with me, right? That I was going to get this, like, how could you raise it so much? Because I raised it a lot. I mean, I raised it by over 25%, right? Okay. And that's what she said to me. And I almost started crying because I was not only relieved, but I was like, yeah, right. And not only that, because it isn't just about making more money, but she also affirmed, she's like, this work matters to me so much. I'm going to find a way to, to pay your new rates. So thank you for role modeling that for me. And I have told that story to like a few people and they looked at me like you looked at me, their eyes got big. They put their hand on their heart and they were like, wow. Goosebumps. And even I was, yeah, even I was wowed by it. And, you know, to come back to something we talked about earlier in terms of like, really loving, I think we talked about it earlier, like really loving our clients and like, mm -hmm. you know, showing up with them because we are partnered together in her healing journey, right? I know what I know. She knows what she knows. She is of course going to support me in doing well and thriving and doing better because she's getting the exact same experience in a different way. Right. I think we have to stop looking at it as like, it's a financial, a financial burden. This is not this is about an energetic exchange and the it's not it's not about the dollar amount it's the energy exchange that's right and somebody on the show uh, in my first like the first few episodes um another therapist Brianna McWilliams she she talked about that and i was like whoa that like completely shifted the way I was thinking about money. And, um, and then I did a bunch of like work around <laughs> money and money mindset. And mm -hmm. um, because I was like, okay, I need to really think about this differently. And, but it's true. So true, Raina. The amount yeah. of energy that you're giving to your clients, they're feeling that and they're saying, I totally see how much you bring to the table when you're in the room with me. And yes, I am definitely willing to meet you in that exchange. That's, That's so right. awesome. Yeah. And in that raising of the rates that happened, I only lost one client who was already out the door anyway. You know, he basically just said, I can't. I can't afford it. And I was like, okay, I'm happy to provide you with referrals. Let's close up our work together. But I mean, 
you know, I don't have the biggest caseload because I don't need a huge caseload anymore in order to make the money that's going to allow me to thrive. And again, as far as living large is like have more connecting time with my family, be able to afford to go do things that we love to do together. Right. Yeah. And, and we need people, I think truly, especially therapists need people to come along and say things like it's all an energy exchange. That was one of the things I learned when I started shifting my money mindset. The other one, and I just wrote to this person on Facebook and thanked her for it because I'm, you know, create, I'm launching this coaching program. She said something really briefly and she goes, you know, money comes and money flows. And I was like, Ooh, <laughs> I love I it. Was like, yeah. Does that mean, right? It's because money comes and money goes means like I'll have it and then I don't have it versus like money comes and money flows. That means I can flow energy. Like I can flow money out by being really generous, right. And doing these things or giving more gifts to my friends. It's one of the things I love to do when I'm thriving. It's a metric of when I'm thriving is I feel much more generous. Mm -hmm. And it's those little pearls of wisdom that I have acquired and that you have acquired along the path of being in the career of being a therapist that allows us to thrive. Like I see you, we're in this interview on this video and we like, I just feel like there's all so much co-regulation and like yes. beautiful, joyful, fun, delightful energy exchange happening because you know what I'm talking about and I know what you're talking about, right? It also yeah. tells me how much work you've done in order to get to this place where again, you could transition from insurance to private pay, whatever, and charge the rates that you want in order to take a week trip or two week trip out to Colorado and totally hang out in the mountains in the, in the beauty of the fall. Yeah. Like, I don't want work to be, work is central to my life, but I'm not, I don't want to live to work. No. I want to work. Yes. I want to work to live. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's that, um, you know, who's the master here yes. in this situation. And yeah. I think that it, what I've observed is that many of us will recreate the same dysfunctional pattern and system from the agencies that we grew up in, you know, grew up in, in terms of like professionally, um, we'll, we'll leave, we'll say, I can't, I don't want to, I don't want to be in that system anymore. It's broken. It's this, it's that. And then we go and we're like, okay, I'm going to recreate the system. And we do exactly the same thing. And then we're like, well, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? <laughs> well, Cause we just recreated the same, the same thing. Of course, it's not going to work. Of course not. You can't, you can't leave one system, make your new system look exactly like the old one and expect it to be different. You have to change the system. That's all right. All around. That's and right. Yeah. And to. it's, it's like changing your thinking. You can't use the set of thinking that got you into the problem to get you out. You need a new set of thoughts, right? Yes. And I love what you just shared with me because I'd never actually thought about that. Like I'd never, and it's true. Like when I went from agency work to running my solo practice and then my group practice, I found myself doing what the system taught me to do, which was to run myself ragged, see as many clients as possible as I could possibly fit in. And then like only live for the weekends, be exhausted all weekend and need to sleep and eat and rest only to go do it again. Like I hadn't even thought of that, that I'm taking this system that I've lived in, in this body, right. And mm -hmm. interacted with all in all the ways and then recreated it. And it's like, I'm not, so I needed a new, that's one of the things I'm so excited about the new program that I'm launching is that I'm wanting to cultivate the soul of the business and have the soul mm. and joy lead so that I'm never losing center. I'm never losing ground of like, wow, Myra, you think you need to see 25 to 30 clients a week, which I was doing before COVID, literally was doing before yes. COVID. And I work in deep trauma, which is a lot of clients, right? Yes. So I love that little pearl of wisdom. Thank you so much for that. That's brilliant thinking. You're right. You can't take the system you worked in that didn't work and then apply it to your life. And then of course we do it because it's the only system that we've known. It's the, it's right. the way that we've been habituated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was genius. Well, thank you. I'm glad that it connected and you had a light bulb moment. It, totally. It's, it, it's true. And if we're really wanting to thrive ourselves, then we, we can't like, it's unrealistic. Somebody came up with this arbitrary number for productivity. And now we're all like, well, how many clients do you see a week? <laughs> oh, how much is full time for you? Is that, you know, 
25, 30, like I, I know some people will see 35, some people will see 40 and I've heard of that. And, oh, I like, I start to have like, my throat is closing up. Like my (laughs) chest feels tight. I feel a little bit nauseated about the idea of seeing 40, having 40 individual sessions in a week, even if they're only 45 minutes. Cause that's what somebody said. Well, they're 45 minutes. Okay. Well, that's too many minutes for this body. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Too many minutes and too many sessions for this body. Thank you very much. Yeah. So like I've been trying to cut back and cut back, um, on the individual sessions so that I have more time to do other creative things that I really enjoy. And, and that like, that brings me to a place of joy, like doing the podcast and getting to have this amazing conversation with you. And like, that is so much fun to me. And I feel like it is a valuable service to others that, um, I am still meeting those, you know, underlying values that I have that brought me to the work that I do. Um, but in a different capacity and a way that gives me energy versus taking it away. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you know, before you brought up the podcast, it's so obvious to me that you have done your work around money mindset and around thriving, because the way that I have felt with you throughout this entire podcast is like easeful. You know, I feel delighted. I feel joyful. And we're both leaning in, right? Like I Mm -hmm. see you lean in with that curiosity because curiosity is so generative in terms of energy. And then we do these laughter, we do the smile thing. And I'm naming this so that your people, I mean, I'm sure everybody can hear it, but I can see it, right? Which means I can resonate. And I have felt so much resonance talking to you. And that just feels good. Like I'm going to be reliving this for the next at least week, if not longer, right? Because it just feels good to talk with people where there's resonance and connection. And again, so much curiosity. And I loved, I love that pearl of wisdom. I mean, I've gotten more than just that out of this conversation, but that you, you know, that systems thing that you transfer, we transfer to our private practice when we move away from agency work, that's a thing to watch out for. And that's really helpful for me. I'm definitely going to be incorporating that in my coaching program as another frame, like here's what we do and here's how to, you know, overcome that. So yes, it's been, I mean, I'm just having such a good time with you. I am too. And, um, I feel like we should probably get to a place of wrapping up (laughs) because it's been a long conversation, but a beautiful, um, a beautiful unfolding in the conversation. And um, again, I feel like as therapists, what helps us to thrive is not just, not just, um, you know, how, how much money we're earning so that we can take care of ourselves, but it's the way in which we are working. Yes. That. Yes that too contributes to our sense of, you know, being in a thriving position. Exactly. Um, Yeah. I think you and I could talk all day. So you're, and you're right. (laughs) Maybe. So towards, yeah. So tell me a little bit about where people can find your coaching program what, like when it's going to be set up, is it going to be on your somatic therapy partners site? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I just talked to my web developer and I'm going to, we're going to be adding a tab that's for a therapist. So there's two things that I'm going to be starting to offer in the new year. Um, and I'm just going to name, so the two names to remember. So right now it's called goprotherapist.com. That would be where the coaching thing, the coaching program is. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to move it um, either before I launch or shortly after I launch to more thrivingtherapist.com. And that's with a plural on the end of therapist, because that's really my mission. Like when I really think about it, that's my mission. It isn't, I mean, all of all, all psychotherapists that are in practice, either private practice or working for an agency are already professional, but we need more thriving therapists because we are the in my opinion, we are the people that make the world go around. And I don't mean that from an egotistical place, but because we focus on mental health and we also have to focus on the broader context of people's lives, like what's happening in their world and you know what's happening as part of their physical 
uh, their physical life that's contributing to their, you know, depression or anxiety. It's important that we are able to thrive so that we can continue to do this work and help heal the world. So my website right now where everything will be found and it will be up by the new year is called somatictherapypartners.com. There will be a tab for therapists. So that one of the things I'll be offering is the coaching program. And then the other thing I'm going to be starting to offer as well is a somatic mentoring program. So whether you, yeah, so whether you have any training in somatic approaches, you don't have to have training in somatic experiencing. Those are three-year-long programs or Hakomi or sensory mitre psychotherapy. Those are some of the big schools when it comes mm -hmm. to trauma therapy. But I feel like clinicians in general, my take without being judgmental or super opinionated about it is that if clinicians are not using the body, like really learning how to incorporate the body as an ally in the healing process they're missing the, one of the biggest pieces of healing that you can offer to your clients like cbt is great it is a foundational piece to psychotherapy and if that's all you're doing i just think that there's more that you could offer so that people can really sustain their healing and move forward and really thrive so those are going to be the two things it's going to be a business coaching program and then somatic mentoring so that's those are the things mm -hmm. that i love to do those are the things that light me up um, and I can't wait to have those programs up and running here in the really near term, like hopefully literally in the next couple of weeks. That's super exciting. Well, hopefully by the time this airs, because we're recording um, mid-December, but yes. by the time this airs, those programs will be available. And so um, I will put the links to the websites in the show notes. And of Wonderful. course, I'll probably check check in with you as I'm putting all that stuff together to make sure that I have the correct links and everything at that time. Thank you. Um, but it has been such a pleasure and joy speaking with you today. And I'm really excited uh, that you're, you know, creating this program to help empower other therapists too. Um, yeah. I, I believe a hundred percent in your mission and it feels truly aligned with my own. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. so it's just been Raina. awesome. It's been a delight. I mean, I've been saying this throughout the interview, but like, thank you again so much for the opportunity. I've had a blast talking to you and we'll just keep staying in touch as the, you know, as the creative psychotherapist that we are. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for listening to this episode of season two of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I really hope that you enjoy this conversation that I had with Myra. I could have spoke with her for hours about what she's doing in her practice. And I felt really inspired that she felt really compelled to receive extensive training in an area of therapy that typically would be viewed as, oh, we don't do that. We don't do touch in therapy. And um, I think what makes what she's doing differently is that she has gone through a tremendous amount of training to develop this particular specialization. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to understand that there's all different kinds of ways that we can be working to help our clients heal. And um, yeah, I hope you're inspired to, you know, follow your passions through and, develop that niched down approach so that you can really target your ideal clients in the practice that you're creating. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.